Well, let's do it, huh? Well, welcome everyone. For anyone listening online or tuning in, uh, any Calvary family or anyone else, welcome to the Refuge Center. We are a direct overflow of Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. Uh, this evening, we're going to be in Luke 24. If you guys want to mark that in your Bibles, uh, just continuing with the thought of resurrection, the resurrected life. But what I want to do this evening is I want to start a little different. I just want to take a moment to read a couple of the Lord's promises over his children. And so you can just listen as I read these out and eventually we'll make our way to Luke 24. But Isaiah 41 tells us, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Psalms 94, 14, for the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. And then finally, Isaiah 62, 12, one of my favorite passages. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. My encouragement and thought this evening as we open the word of God and as we approach the gospel and look at what the Lord has for us this evening, that we would take encouragement and heart that God will always be there for his children. And so Luke 24, and what I want to do is because it's such a long passage, there is a temptation to read through it, but we're going to, we're going to not do that. We're going to pick it up in verse 13. It says that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with, uh, with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people and how our chief chief priest and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes. And besides all this it is now the third day since these things have happened. You guys, the day that Jesus came, are you willing to walk with the Lord? Let's go ahead and pray and let's just let him take the lead and uh, just see where he wants to go. And so heavenly father, God, we love you so much, and God, we're thankful, God, that we get to walk with you. God, I know that so often uh, in life and in ministry and just the day-to-day -day grind, God, it can seem like we have to walk with you, God, but you're, you're, that, that's not who you are. God, your yoke is light and your burden is easy. God, so I just pray, Lord, that you would take control of this time. God, that you would quiet our hearts and our minds. God, that you would speak in ways, God, we need to hear from you. God, I need to hear from you. God, I pray for anything uh, in my mind or anything in my spirit that's not from you. God, that you would remove these things, that your word would come down, that you would meet us here. God, so we love you. We thank you and we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, Luke 24, the day Jesus came. And once again, the question that I have are you willing to meet Jesus? Are you willing to walk with the Lord when he comes into your life? Because so often, and we see this many times in the gospel, we see this oftentimes when we look at the different passages of, uh, you know, concerning the resurrection, but many times Jesus, he, he doesn't come 
like he think like we would think he's going to come. He doesn't come or he doesn't work how we think he's going to work. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but I know so often with myself, you know, I really have plans and expectations and I really have, uh, you know, kind of a box that I want to put Christ in. And then he comes and he does things completely a different way. And I tell him, Lord, that's not how we're supposed to do it. And he is to remind me that he is the savior of the world and that I am just a child prone to wander. And so looking at this passage, we're going to have some of an outline looking at just this exchange between these disciples who are unnamed, by the way, in the sense that they uh, were not part of the 12 and they really, you, nowhere else in scripture do you see anything about them. Um, which is going to be just kind of a cool, a neat point of application within itself as we get to. But looking at just this exchange, we're going to see the pains of a doubting heart. We're going to see the comfort of a redeeming Savior. And we're going to see the call to forever embrace hope. One more time. The pains of a doubting heart, the comfort of a redeeming Savior, and the call to forever embrace hope. And kind of an opening thought, maybe a point of application, uh, I would say twofold, that by nature... Every Christian doubts to an extent, but that secondly, even with our doubt, because you will doubt within your Christian walk to some extent, that we take heart because God is in the business of restoring dead things. And so have you come to a place of deadness or doubt in your life? Have you come to a place where maybe you're beginning to think that the promises that you felt that Jesus had for you, the promises that God had for you, that they're not coming to pass, that they're, he's not working. We have to understand you guys, he is working. Romans 4, 17 says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, speaking of Abraham, the father of faith. I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. You get that? Your story isn't over yet. Your struggles and your convictions and your failures and your trials and your tragedies, all these things, your story's not over. As long as Jesus has been raised from the dead, then there's a purpose, right? Because Paul says, hey, if Jesus didn't, wasn't raised from the dead, then we're the most pitied of all people. But guess what? He has been raised from the dead. And so what direction are you heading this evening? And so looking at this passage, contextually speaking, we're going to note a couple things that I think are going to be important or key for us to pick up. And the first thing that we need to understand looking at this is that we see that hope has died, meaning literally, you guys, this is the same day. This isn't a week later at the refuge center. This isn't two months later when the Lord had appeared to many disciples. This is the very same day. There's still a darkness over as the Sabbath is ending and the, the hour, you know, just the situation, the, the, the day, you know, it may have even been just an hour or two hours. They're still in the very depth. They're in the very weight of all these things. But notice that Jesus is always willing to reveal himself to those who are willing to seek. We see that one author actually goes on to say, speaking of these two disciples, because when we look at that, when we look at them, we see that only one of them was named. And we don't read about him anywhere else in scripture. And the other one goes completely unnamed. You know what that means? That God is in the business of showing himself to no ones. God is in the business of showing up when you don't expect him, when you think it's over, when you think you failed, when you think that everything has gone wrong, when your dreams have been dashed. God's in the business of restoring dead things. Can I get an amen for everyone listening online? They weren't famous apostles, as one theologian says. They were simple and half anonymous followers of Jesus, I take it as a characteristic of the Lord that in the glory of his resurrection life, he gave himself with such fullness of disclosure to these unknown and undistinguished men. He still reveals himself to lowly hearts. He is the savior for the common man. He is the Lord who does not spurn the humble. Are you feeling low tonight? 
Are you feeling small in life where you don't have direction? You don't have answers. Your dreams have been dashed. Take heart. The Lord is ready to show up. And so contextually jumping into this passage, we see that it's a very hopeless situation. Darkness has set the tone, but Jesus shows up. And so jumping into this passage, Luke 24, 13 through 16, it says that very day, Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And so my question, are you willing to respond to the Lord when he shows up? Are you willing to respond? Because looking at this, we have to understand. See, and this is going to be a point of application that as we explore this passage and as we explore the text and we explore the gospel, we have to understand in responding to Christ, you guys, there is a point in which holiness matters. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Leviticus 20, 26, You shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. You hear that, you guys? That you guys belong to God. If you've given your life over to the Lord, if you've given your life over uh, to Christ, that your life is his. And so holiness matters. How we live our life matters. And how this comes into application is so often I think that we can really mix God up. We can really mix up who he is and how he wants to work. And so we see that he wants to bring dead things to life, but we see that they're also in the needs to be a response on our part. And so I ask you, are you willing this evening to give up your sin? Are you willing this evening to give up your compromise? Are you willing this evening to respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Because the Lord, he wants to lead you and he wants to show himself strong. And so looking at this, I think it's important looking at this because who, who, who were these individuals? Where did they come from? What was their life look like? In Luke chapter 8, we know that there was many who followed him. But who were these men? And as a point of application, I think it's key to pick up notice, you guys, that they were concerned over the matters at hand. And what I mean by that is when we look at the text, not only, right, and so we got to put ourselves in in the disciples' shoes. Not only uh, has hopelessness kind of taken over, and they're kind of just stuck in in this situation where their expectations have been crushed, and they they really, uh, their Savior, who they thought was going to redeem Israel, has been crucified. Um, But when you look at the word, Speaking and you look at the word discussing, when you go to the original Greek, there are two different words. And so what this means, the word for discussion here, it literally means to examine or to, to maybe to even dispute. And so you gotta, there, there's a sense where they're really, they're involved in these things, where they're examining what had happened. They're speaking. And as they go from speaking to discussing, It comes to the place where their passion begins to get rekindled. Because why? They had cared for the things of the Lord. They had cared. They had walked with the Lord. And that's going to be a point of application, you guys, that we're going to get to later in the text. But we need to understand that without conviction, there is no genuine conversion. Hold on to that one. And we're going to get back to that in a little bit. Uh, But what I want to do, looking at this passage as we see that Jesus appears himself, because what we see here is Christians, we're going to doubt. That, that's going to happen in our life. We're going to hit seasons where we really struggle or we really, uh, you know, begin to think that like, hey, you know, maybe I heard God wrong. You know what? If you, if you were centered in God's word and you were being led by the Holy Spirit, you didn't hear God's word wrong. His promises still apply. His promises are still good. And I want to just even open this evening, open this text, you know, inviting 
asking that we'd consider that we'd humble ourselves. Earlier, I went through Romans 8 as we're doing the afternoon uh, devos and just being reminded that if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. If you're in Christ, you can't be lost. If you don't walk after the, the flesh, you know that you walk after the spirit, that you're going to be forever his. You guys, God is speaking to his children. And so we see, even though there's hopelessness, that God still pursues hope by pursuing his children. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with him and eat with him and he with me. And obviously in context, it's talking about lukewarm believers repenting, but there's still the application of coming to Jesus. Are you willing to come to Jesus? I think of that day and that morning, what it must have been like. As they walk and Jesus appears to him. What it must have been like, Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which is not satisfied? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, and hear that your soul may live. God is working, and God is speaking, and God is inviting. Isaiah 42, 3, a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. You guys, God has your back. And as long as we give our lives over to him in the sense where, you know, because one of the thoughts that I got hit in studying this passage, as an opening point of application, we need to understand that as Christians, we're all going to doubt. But the Lord comforted me in these things that not only does he help us through our doubts, but if you're struggling with doubt, if you're struggling with conviction, that means you're spiritually alive. Dead men don't struggle. Dead men don't have convictions. If you're having convictions, that means the Lord is trying to speak to you. The Lord is trying to work with you. And so would you consider Christ? Would you consider his word? Would you consider his invitation? Would you consider his gentleness? Jesus, strong and kind. His word says that when I am weak, I come to Jesus. And his word says that when I am tired, I come to Jesus. His word says that when I am tempted, I come to Jesus. And his word says that when I don't know where to go, he is the way, the way, the light, and the truth. No man enters except through Jesus. You guys give your life to Jesus. And so last week, what I had done is I had listed off three signs of a doubting heart. And so what I want to do quickly is reverse that, giving three ways we guard against doubt. First and foremost, we need to understand that we spend time in God's word. Luke 24 through 20, or Luke 24, 27, he has to rebuke the disciples for not uh, knowing these things and not understanding the word, right? Because we have to remember, you guys, Jesus, he had told his disciples what was going to happen. He had told his disciples he was, disciples he was going to be crucified. And I think so much of the resurrected life in us is coming to a place where we understand that regardless of what happens in my life, that God is true to his word. And so that as long as I stick with him, I'm okay, whatever happens. I'm okay with it. Uh, I'm okay if things get crucified and I'm okay if things get resurrected. Why? Because my hope isn't in the resurrection itself. My hope is the one, is in the one who was resurrected. You guys, the one who has power over death. And so first and foremost, we spend time in God's word. 
Psalms 119.105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. Psalms 119.9-11, how can a young man or woman keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Spurgeon goes on to say, half our fears arise from, from neglecting God's word. Would you take the time to get into God's word? Because as we do, we see our doubts get pushed away. Secondly, an interesting point of application, be humble enough to receive the testimony of others. And what I mean by this specifically is we have to remember that in, 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 if you, we had read on further in the passage, we would have seen it. But when we back up at the very start of the chapter, Jesus appear, appears to Mary. Jesus appears to the women. And this is interesting because it's a point of maybe apologetic application. If you want to, if you want to come up with a myth or if you want to come up with a legend, a legend, you're not going to have the first appearance be to women. In those days, we have to remember that women, they weren't, their word wasn't even good in a dispute or court of law. And I'm going to refrain from making any jokes about that as my wife is most likely listening. But, uh, you know, you, you, you would think if you, because there have been many people. See, when we study this passage, as I study it, one thing I discovered, and I won't list them just because, um, it, it's really, you know, it, it's a lot of them and most of them are very poorly thought out, but, um, there's a lot of theories about what really happened. A lot of theories basically saying that Jesus didn't raise, wasn't raised from the dead, that Jesus didn't get himself up off that cross. And there's all these reasons. And as we look at these reasons, what's interesting is that when we get to this point and we look at this, that even skeptics who reject the gospel and reject the resurrection of Christ get stuck on this point, and they admit that if you are going to make up a story, there's no reason to have women be the first witness. You're not better than your neighbor. You're not better than that woman down the street who's always just praising Jesus. And, it, you know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but anyone in here or anyone online get critical? Anyone get prideful? I know I sure do. I know that many times I would get, I would guess that the Lord's trying to work in my life. But because of my own pride or skepticism, I reject what someone has to say. You're not better than your neighbor. God can speak through the woman down the street. God can speak through that child. God can speak through all sorts of methods. I'll, I'll never forget years ago I was living with a missionary family and while they loved the Lord very dearly, one thing they did not do is keep a quiet or a strict household. It was a missionary family. The children had no bedtime. It was continually kids running and jumping and yelling and hooting and hollering and, uh, you know, the... Man of the house, I love him dearly. Jack of all trades, just love the Lord dearly, serve the Lord. Um, very easy going. Didn't really, never really took the time to rear in his kids or, you know, deal with things. And in one sense, I get frustrated, but in another sense, I, I saw it was very weird to see his compassion in that, in the sense where he let his kids kind of figure out life from a distance and he'd watch in. And if things got too complicated, he'd step in, he'd correct uh, the kids, but I was going through a particular situation and I felt that the Lord wasn't speaking to me. And as I'm reading my Bible and I've been reading and trying to figure out what the Lord has been speaking to me and what he's trying to speak to me in this situation, the youngest boy, Eric, probably about six years old, comes up to me and reads scripture. He reads the scripture and he says, I just wanted to read this to you to show you that you always ought to pray and never lose heart because Jesus listens to your prayers. In eight hours of studying my Bible, the Lord used a rambunctious six-year-old to speak. You're not better than your neighbors. Stop being so prideful because it just may be 
that God is trying to work because as a point of application, what we're going to see is that it's a hardness of heart. And so often, because here's the thing, when we look at the issues of doubt and lack of trust and lack of belief, we have to understand that doubt isn't the issue. Doubt is just a symptom or a byproduct of a heart that's not right. Years ago, a friend of mine told me the story that he had gone on to confess everything that he had been doing to the dean of men. And we had been speaking for a while, and I had encouraged him to confess these things. And he comes from a very vital background, and so he he was not in the place of confessing. But after the appropriate time, he finally got to the place of confessing. And as he confessed, and he he went on to tell me this a a couple weeks later when I saw him, but as he went on to confess, he couldn't help but notice how unfazed or unaffected the dean of men was by all these horrendous things that he was confessing. And finally, out of curiosity, he asked the dean of men, he, he says, hey, you're not angry or what's going on? The dean of men said something to him that he transferred to me that I'll never forget. He said, my brother... These sins and all these things in your heart, they're not the issue. The issue is your heart itself. All these sins are just a byproduct of a twisted and fallen heart, you guys. Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitful and wicked. We can't trust it. I've been building homes during the day for the past couple of weeks just as in the sense where... Um, right now with the high school kids, we can't meet or go anywhere. And so I've been building homes, and I found it very interesting, maybe a lesson I might use for the kids. Uh, the first day on the job, my boss was showing me the difference between different beams, and he showed me that the heartwood, literally towards the center of the heart of the wood, it can't be trusted because it moves in every different direction. And so all it's good for is to be used as scrap. And I thought about that because so often, trust your heart, trust your emotions. You know, hey, God's near. I'll tell you what, God is near. But you know what? If you're living in sin, you've left the blanket. You've left the umbrella of promises. If you're living in the flesh, you've left the sense of God protecting you. You, We don't trust our heart. We don't trust where the heart takes us. We don't trust the pride. We don't trust the doubt. You know, and so we look and we see, are we willing to humble ourselves? Because looking at this first point of application, notice that the text says that Jesus himself drew near. Whatever you're facing this evening, that Jesus is near. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's a fullness of joy. At your right hands are pleasures forevermore. Psalms 23, 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 34, 17 through 18, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Finally, Zephaniah 3, 17, the Lord Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Are we willing to receive Jesus? Because looking at this passage, I find it interesting that the disciples didn't notice Jesus. Now, what's interesting is when you look at this passage, there's many different reasons and there's many scholars who say many different things and why these disciples didn't recognize Jesus. You know, they say, well, he was in pain, or or they were in pain, or it was dark, or maybe they had been crying, or maybe they had dirt in their eyes. You know what? Maybe Jesus was just trying to be compassionate. 
You ever thought of that? See, what happens when we look at this passage, we notice, and we won't go there for the sake of time, but when Jesus appears to Mary, she doesn't recognize him either. And I think that there's something to be said in this, that Jesus, he, see, Jesus, he, he's giving the disciples the opportunity to exercise faith. He's giving the disciples the opportunity to have a testimony when Jesus asks what's going on. How often has Jesus, how often has the Lord come to us and said, what's going on? And rather than rejoicing with faith or rather than claiming his promises back to him, because Jesus, again, Jesus had told his disciples that he was going to be crucified. How often do we fall into doubt and begin to complain and begin to cry out and begin to tell the Lord that he is forsaken us. And we have to be reminded, just like Jonah, just like Elijah, who the Lord had to correct, he said, no, Elijah, I have 7,000 others who haven't bowed down to bow. You're not alone in the Christian faith. Your doubts and your struggles and your convictions and your failures in your life, Jesus is with you. Jesus is walking the road with you. Why? Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. John 8, 36. Romans 8, there is no condemnation. If you've given your life to him, he, he walks with you in every sense of the word. And so personally, what we see here is that our trials give us a place platform to worship the Lord. And so picking it back up, Luke 24, 17 through 20, and there's a couple more thoughts. That I want to close out with. Seeing that Jesus is near in the midst of our doubts, but Luke 24, 17 through 20, it says, And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened these days? Can you just imagine the tone of Cle- Cleopas' voice? Are you the only one who's not aware? Have you been here? The past couple days. Have you heard what's going on? Have you seen? You know, you can almost, you can almost hear the tone in Cleopas' voice. You know, hey, have you not heard the news? COVID's killing everyone. Everyone's in fear. Do you not watch the news? Do you not go on YouTube? But Jesus, because he wants to take us further, he draws these things out. He goes, I love the compassion of Jesus in the sense that Jesus doesn't immediately answer. Jesus doesn't immediately reveal himself. Why? What that shows us is that in your trial or in your pain or in your struggle, God might just have a lesson for you that he's waiting to reveal. And so take heart. that God is on your side because looking at this, I think one of the questions, because picking it up, verse 21, it says, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and they did not find his body. They came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who went with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And so we see, you know, it's just as they had said. They go and there's an empty tomb. And I think about this, and I think in last week I had talked about Mary going to the tomb, you know, with a stone rolled away. And I think it's a good word picture because I think many of us have stones over our heart that we're refusing to let the Lord answer. Because looking at this, you know, as I was studying, one of the questions or one of the ideas was kind of false expectations. And you guys, we need to understand as a point of application that false expectations will always lead to a failure to see God. I'll say that one more time. False expectations will always lead to a failure to see God. Because one of the questions that gets brought up, was Jesus supposed to die? Because they were looking for a political prince. 
Instead, they got a suffering servant. They were looking for a conquering king. Instead, they got one who suffered and went quietly to the cross. And I, I, I think there's something to that because looking at this, we see you guys in short within the Christian walk. See, the desire for greatness in itself is not a bad thing. But when we begin to pervert that greatness away from God, we begin to get in serious trouble. And looking at this, we see that when we look to be crucified for the sake of Christ, we end up resurrected. But when we seek to be glorified, at the very best, we end up getting our vision and our dreams crucified. Or very worse, missing the kingdom of God. I'll say that one more time. When we look to be crucified for the sake of Christ, we end up resurrected. But when we seek to be glorified, we end up, best case scenario, getting our vision and our dreams crucified. Or at the very worst, missing the kingdom of heaven. And we see this with the young rich ruler. He thought that greatness was something that was within. He thought that greatness was something that could be earned. He thought that somehow in all these things that he could work his way into heaven. And Jesus had to tell him, hey, go sell all that you have and follow me. And so my question is, if Jesus came to you and said, drop everything you have and come and follow me, would you go? Because so often we're trying to earn salvation. And how all these things tie together and come together is because the disciples, they had expected Jesus to redeem Israel. But they had not expected him to go That way, they wanted to believe, but their view of who they thought Jesus was, was blocking what God was trying to do. And so the word here, when Jesus says foolish, it literally means unable to discern or slow of mind. How's that for some humbling pie? Jesus calls you slow of mind. But we have to remember you guys, because it's a, Jesus isn't harsh for no reason. Go ahead, let's pick it up, and let's close out with this. Luke 24. Verse 25, it says, And he had said to them, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so we see that he goes back from Moses to Jesus, and he lists everything. The word here for prophet, it means one who is moved by the Spirit of God and hence his organ or spokesman and or one who solemnly declares to men what he has received by inspiration, especially concerning future events in particular, such as relate to the cause and kingdom of God, to human salvation. One who solemnly declares to men what he has received by inspiration, especially concerning future events, and in particular, such as relate to the cause and kingdom of God and to human salvation. And so I bring that up because we, you know, when we look, people said that Jesus was a prophet. And when we go into the Old Testament, you had three different classes or you had three different areas, um, you know, the uh, categories. You had prophet, priest or king, right? And looking at this, Jesus fulfills all these things. And so what we see literally is that he he explains to his disciples that he has to suffer. Hebrews 5.8, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Second Corinthians 4.17, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And then finally, 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Jesus had to remind the disciples that these things were supposed to happen. And in our life, we can't, we can't freak out when we begin to hit trials or when we begin to, you know, hit situations where we thought God was working or we thought God 
God was going to do this. We thought God was going to lead this, lead this way or go this way or do this or bless this job or bless this relationship or whatever it may be. And here you find yourself doubting and, and complaining and wondering, where is God? Why is he forsaken me? He hasn't forsaken you. He's walking with his children. The word here for glory, it literally means the splendor or brightness which is over the moon and stars. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. But we, ha- we remember you guys that Christ, he has been raised. He has defeated the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6 says, Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Check it out. This is where I want to go with it. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And so literally we see Paul saying, hey, you want to learn about the resurrection? Go speak to these men. They're still around. These things can be tried. These things can be tested. These things can be verified. Last week I spoke on Norman Geisler writing a three-page response to a 700-page book and why the resurrection never took place and how he literally says in three pages, starting the letter saying, you, my friend, are a brother in Christ. I love you very much, but your reasoning and your logic is terrible. This is why. And he dismantles a 700-page book in three pages. You're not the only one to doubt. You're not the only one to struggle. You're not the only one to suffer. You're not the only one to go through these things. Hebrews talks about a great high priest who has gone before us. And so closing what we see, we see that Jesus, the Messiah, was the seed of the woman whose heel was bruised. We see that he was the blessing of Abraham to all nations. We see that he was the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We see that he was the man who wrestled with Jacob. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. He was the voice of the burning bush. He is the great Passover lamb, the prophet greater than Moses, the captain of the Lord's army to Joshua, the ultimate redeemer mentioned in Ruth, the son of David who is a king greater than David, the suffering savior of Psalms 22, the good shepherd of Psalms 23, the wisdom of Proverbs, and the lover of the songs of Solomon. And finally, the Savior described in the prophets and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and the princely Messiah of Daniel who would establish a kingdom that would never end. Revelation, behold, I hold the keys of life and death. All authority has been given to me, you guys. And we won't go there, but at the end of the chapter, he goes on to send his disciples out, commissioning them. And so I would ask in closing, what has the Lord called you to do this evening? What has he called you to give up? What has he called you to embrace? What has he called you to forsake? What he is, what has he called you to take on? Because God walks with his children, and all of us have a role to play. And we, you know, make, make no mistake about it. God's a God of love. I love listening to some of the Reformed theology. For those listening, for those that don't know what that is, it basically, uh, they believe that you're either saved or you're not saved. And I, I love listening to their teachings because some of them are so knowledgeable. But every, every time I listen, I'm left with a single thought that everything they have to say contradicts John 3:16 for God's love the whole wide world that he gave his that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life are you sinking this evening are you drowning in doubts in bitterness in false expectations take heart because God is near and Jesus is near and so We're going to close in prayer, but I'd encourage anyone online listening. 
anyone who's not sure of your salvation or just needing an encouragement to maybe, uh, I know that we stream this out on Facebook and I believe YouTube, uh, you know, send in an email. If you have questions or a prayer request or concern, or if you're even able to stop by the church, the church is here for you. The church wants to help you and walk with you during this time. And most importantly, greater than the church, there's someone greater and mightier, and his name is Jesus. And so let's pray. So Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you for this evening. God, we pray, Lord, that you would just work out that message and you continue to just send us away with hope and restoration, and conviction if we need it. God, for anyone listening who isn't sure of the gospel or what it is, God, we humble ourselves. We confess our need of a Savior, God. We confess our sins and say that Jesus Christ alone is King. That Jesus Christ alone is Savior. That you have the keys over life and death. God, that we confess all our sin, we confess all our wickedness, and we cry out to a holy and loving and perfect and merciful God. And we ask that you would fill us anew. We ask that your Holy Spirit would revive us and teach us and lead us in the way we should go. God, we look to you for direction in every area of life. God, we love you. We thank you, God. May we just continue to honor you in everything we do. God, we ask these things. And everyone said, amen. God bless you guys.